So going back to our rounding, making sure we remember how all of these little rounding rules work. So for number one, uh, we're rounding to the fourth decimal, which if you take a look at our original problem, the fourth decimal is where the three is. I purposefully did this because I want you, because I get questions from people saying, well, it, but it says to round to the fourth decimal. What do I do? Well, there's nothing after it that's going to change it. So it is what it is. That is that number rounded to the fourth decimal. You don't have to do anything else onto it. All right, next one. We're rounding to three decimal places. So that means we're rounding to where the nine is. All right, so that tells me I'm going to start with 27.40. And the question is, is it going to be a nine? Or does it become, well, let's say it becomes a 10. Should it, is it closer to 9 or 10? It's closer to 10, yes, because I look at that one next digit, which is a 6. If that number is 5 or more, it tells me to round it up. Okay, so I can't really write 0 .4010, right? Okay, well, what we do then is we carry that 1 over, and the 1... I'm sorry, the 0 becomes a 1. There's my 10 right there, 4, 1, 0. Again, kind of going back to that idea we talked about yesterday, it's like saying, is it closer to 0 0.409, or is it closer to 0 0.410? That's really the question that we're answering when we round it. And again, those are the only possibilities, the ones right next to each other like that. All right, next one. We're rounding to the second decimal place. It's again one of those nines. Is it going to stay a nine, or is it going to round up? It's going to round up, yeah. And so this is going to become a three point, well, this becomes a ten, so i got to carry that one over to the six. So the six becomes a seven. And again, why is it? Why does it affect the next one up? Because we're just looking to see, is it closer to 3.69 or is it closer to 3.70? Those two closest numbers that it could possibly be between, we're just looking to see which of those it is. And so, on to that last one then. We're going to be doing 16.95 and a whole bunch of stuff after that. But since it's going to just one decimal, I don't care about all this stuff out here. All I care about is that one next digit where the 5 is. Does the 5 tell me to leave it alone or to round it up? It says to round it up, yes. Because if it's 5 or more, we round it up. So then, basically, I'm deciding, is it closer to 16.9 or, well, that would be 17.0? Because that's the next biggest. Since we said up, the answer is the 17.0. And so that would be your correct answer there. All right, so if we are going back into graphing today, then, we got to deal with the other two equation types. This is the first of those, and this is about as simple of an equation as you can have. Notice one difference between this and what we saw the other day. The other day, we graphed absolute value, so it had those bars around it. And we graphed x squared, so it had an exponent in it. This one has nothing in it. It is the absence of any of those other things that's going to end up telling us what the shape is. Now, to sketch this graph, it's actually pretty easy to kind of plot points because whatever x is, y is going to be the same thing. So, like, if x is 1, y is 1. Or if x is 2, y is 2. Or if x is, let's go all the way out. If x is 10, y is 10, right? Uh, what if x is negative 10? y is negative 10. X and Y are always the same thing. And so, because of that, we can see that we end up with a graph here that's a line. Now, since it's a line, try to use a straight edge to draw it on. This simple equation here with nothing else in it, it gave us a line, right? Hence why these types of equations and these types of graphs are called linear. Because notice, linear starts with the word line. And so this is our parent function. This is the parent function for all of the linears. And then it's just a matter of playing with it and modifying it for the next few problems. All right, so in this case, we got y equals x plus 3. Now, it might be a little bit hard to tell which way that's moving it. 
Because is it with the X or not? Well, if we were like putting in parentheses, or if I was going to make this look like an absolute value type equation or something like that, I would be putting those absolute value bars like that. It's going to behave the same way as what we had there, except because this is not absolute value, it's more like parentheses there, but that looks weird, right? But that's the way it's working. That plus 3, it's not being forced in with X, therefore it is hanging on the end. And if the plus 3 is hanging on the end, which way does it move it? It's up and down. Which way does plus go? Is that up or is it down? It is up. And so, in order to graph this then, I'm going to make the exact same graph that I just made on the last problem, except that the whole thing is moved up 3. So I'm going to put my first point up 3. Back in the olden days, we actually had a special name for that number hanging on the end. When you first learned how to graph, that was called the y-intercept way back when. And in this case, it is just the y-intercept, although we're going to add a little bit of complexity to these here in a minute, where we're going to see that if we do some other stuff, it isn't always. But when we write in this format, yeah, that vertical shift like this is the exact same thing as the y-intercept was. Just now you're learning that it can be applied to more than just lines. All right, so I do make the exact same graph that I made before. You'll notice in that last one, we went over one, up one on the right side, and we went down one, left one on the other side. And then once you plotted each of those points, you use your straight edge to go ahead and draw in your line through those points. Now for this one, this graph looks very similar to the last one, but it's not quite the same, right? That equation, we got the parentheses in there. Well, in this case, the 3 is in the parentheses with the x. And so that tells us that it's telling us to move in the left-right direction. Would a plus 3 move it left or move it right? It would move it left, absolutely. And so, again, it's like we're taking our parent function, the exact same graph, except we're moving it left 3. So I put my first point left 3. And so I go left 3, and then I start making my graph. So I still go over 1, up 1. And I keep going over one, up one, all the way along. And then once you plotted all the points, go ahead and break out your straight edge, draw the line that goes through those points. And when you do that, you probably are noticing something. Look at this graph compared to the graph we just made. They're the same, right? This one and the last one are the same. What That should make sense because what are the parentheses actually doing to this equation? Uh, well, they can kind of shift our perspective in terms of vertical versus horizontal shift. But mathematically, these parentheses, because there's nothing written out front here, are doing nothing. This equals the same thing as just y equals x plus 3. So yes, they do give us the same graph. So why did I bother? Because I wanted to show you what happens and how we could move it side to side and not just up and down, but that they do, in fact, give us the same thing and be able to prove that. So we did the parts where we shifted it up and down, then a separate one where we shifted it over. But now I put them together, and all of a sudden it makes it seem a lot harder. So let's go ahead and start seeing how we'd handle it. The number that's inside with x here affects it in the x direction. Minus 4, we'll move it which way, left or right? It'll move it right, yes, because minus always goes right. Now the minus 2, it's hanging on the end. It's outside of the parentheses. That means it must be going up and down. Which way does minus 2 go? It goes down. And so I'm going to put my first point right 4 and down 2. Notice this works exactly the same way as it did when we were graphing absolute value. It works the same way as when we graphed a quadratic. All of these rules that we are seeing in terms of how it moves and all that, they work for every single function type. Everyone you've seen and everyone you haven't seen. They all work the same way. Which is what I love about them. All right, so once I have that first point, that's my starting point, and otherwise I make the exact same graph as the parent function from here. Remember, the parent function, it goes up 1 over 1 on both sides. So 
I'm just putting in those points, going up one over one or down one left one, to get all those points in and then go ahead and draw the line that goes through them. Now as a side note, in this particular case we could have done it ever so slightly differently. I think there are a couple of you that actually made it into just y equals x minus 4 minus 2 because those parentheses weren't doing anything and then combined the 4 and the 2. And notice if we do that, that gives us y equals x minus 6, which means it starts down 6. Yes, in fact, it does give us the exact same thing. But because it follows the same pattern as all the other ones, we don't really need to do all that because we should know what the pattern is. All right, now for this one, we're going to be graphing y equals the square root of x. Now, remember, square root means what number times itself equals this. So the square root of 0, well, 0 times 0 is 0, so the square root of 0 is 0. Hence, like if I were making an, a table out of it, it'd be 0, 0 like that. Uh, what about 1? What's the square root of 1? That's 1, yeah, because 1 times 1 is 1. This is a very familiar setup so far, right? Basically, every graph is started with 0, 0, and 1, 1 but it's always a matter of what happens after that that changes things. Because if I then go to x equals 2 and say, what's the square root of 2? Things get messy if I do that. The square root of 2 is 1.414 and so on. I don't want to mess around with that. I'm not going to worry about plotting decimals here. So I'm going to jump ahead on the x's to something that's easier. Square root of 3. Nope, also a decimal. Square root of 4. Yes, I do know that one. The square root of 4, in other words, what number times itself equals 4, is 2. So notice, if I plug x equals 4 in, I get 2 out. That means I go from my starting point, I go over to 4, and I'm going to go up 2. I'm counting from my starting point. So go over 4, up 2. <coughs> And then I want to look for the next number that I can actually take the square root of. So, square root of 5, decimal. Square root of 6, decimal. Square root of 7, decimal. Square root of 8, decimal. Square root of 9, 3. Okay, so then my next one I'm going to go to is 9, 3. The square root of 9 is 3, so then I plot the point over 9, up 3 from the starting point. And so then that tells me I have a graph that's looking like this. Now, what about over in the negatives? What's the square root of negative 1? Well, that would actually be a bit of a problem. If you punched uh, into your calculator square root of negative 1, it would throw a little fit. It throws itself onto the floor, kicks and screams, and says, I can't do that. Because it can't. There is no such thing as the square root of a negative. We can't do it. So actually, there is no graph to the left of that first point. It literally starts at 0, 0 and goes from there. So that that you're seeing there is the graph. That's the final answer, final result. All right, now for this one, we have y equals the square root of x plus 3. And it's a matter of what does the plus 3 do? And we answer that question by saying, is the plus 3 trapped inside with the x? No. No. In order for it to be trapped inside the x, that square root symbol would have to be going over the 3 as well. So it's at the end. That tells me that it's moving it up and down. And specifically, a plus 3 moves it up 3. So I'm going to go on to my graph, and I'm going to put my first point up 3. And from there, I now make the exact same graph that I just made on the other axes, just I'm starting at that point instead. So I go over 1, up 1. And then, again, counting from my first point, I go over 4, up 2, because the square root of 4 is 2. And then from my starting point, I go over 9, up 3, because the square root of 9 is 3. And that's all of them I can fit on my grid. So draw the curve that goes through it, and you're done. That's square root graph. All right, for this one. We've got to start by saying, what does the plus 2 do? 
Well, the plus 2, is it inside with the x? Yes, it is, because it is under that line. And so, that means it moves it in the x direction. Specifically, which way does plus 2 move it, left or right? Left. Left. And so then, I'm going to put my first point, left 2 which for some of us might start bending our brains a little bit, because you might be thinking, wait, that makes it negative. Well, it's only because of the shift. I'm still going to make my graph the same way, over 1, up 1, over 4, up 2, over 9, up 3, counting from that first point. I'm always counting from that first point that I plotted. So although I actually have some negative numbers in here, it's only because I'm adding 2 to them. So for instance, Negative 1, I used to plug it in and that would give me a negative number, but now notice if I plug negative 1 into this, negative 1 plus 2 actually gives me a positive 1. So I'm actually taking the square root of a positive number. Which, if you want to dwell on that in your own mind a little bit, can also tell you why plus goes left and minus goes right. Alright, so this last one, in order to make this graph, again we decide what everything does. The minus 1. It is inside with x, therefore it moves left and right. Specifically, minus 1 goes to the right. Minus 3, it is not inside with x. It's outside the square root. And so that tells me it goes up and down. Minus goes down. All right, so knowing that, I know where to put my first point. I go right 1, I go down 3, and I plot my first point there. And once I've done that, I know the entire graph. Because the entire graph follows the exact same pattern just now from that point. So I go over 1, up 1, over 4, up 2, and whenever I say over 4, up 2, remember I'm counting from the starting point, not from the last point, from the starting point. And the same thing with the over 9, up 3, I'm counting that from the starting point. And so then plot the points, and yes, the points have to be right on here, and then draw the curve that goes through it.